Welcome, everyone, on this chilly winter morning. Welcome to the warmth of this building. If you're worshiping from home or later, welcome to the warmth of your own fire and your own cup of coffee. But most of all this morning, welcome to the warmth of this community. God has called us to be a community, and we call ourselves the church. And it's a community that lives in relationship to God through the love and grace of Jesus Christ and nurtured by the warm glow of the Holy Spirit, working among us even in these cold, dormant days of winter, God is up to something. So welcome, welcome this morning. Thank you to uh, Sandra for your flexibility on last minute, uh, filling in for people who have, uh, are isolating and all sorts of other things. So uh, again, thank you to everyone for being flexible this morning. As we uh, continue to worship here, we want to acknowledge that we are worshiping on land that was traditionally used by First Nations people, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the neutral people. We're grateful that they cared for the earth and we want to follow in their footsteps as being good stewards of the land and learn better how to live in relationship with all people and to care for creation. May God help us in this endeavor. There are a few announcements I will highlight. I hope that you are able to read the info page if you have not already. Um, our financial annual meeting is being held next Sunday, January the 30th, right after our worship service, and we hope that you will consider uh, joining us for that, either in person or on Zoom. Uh, our next Christian education time is scheduled for February the 13th. Again, the elders will give leadership as we try to discern how God is moving among us in this season of congregational life. And beyond our gathering on Sunday morning, we are also part of a larger community that is at work all week long. And I want to draw attention to the announcement in our info pages about Hidden Acres. There is an announcement there regarding a job opportunity, an assistant director. Perhaps you know someone who would be good at that uh, role and you want to encourage them. Um, at least it's there to help us remember to pray for the work of Hidden Acres Camp. So as we uh, take these next moments, uh, let's open our hearts to God as we prepare for worship and listen to the musical interlude. Thank you, Sandra. Today we're continuing our winter worship series, Living the Questions. We've been asking, why faith? Why worship? And today we're asking, why community? I think that's like asking, why are you here with me? And why am I here with you today? Why do we gather together? With this in mind, please join me in our call to worship, which is projected for you on the screen. God calls us by name. Together we listen, for we are deeply loved by God. God calls us to be transformed. Together we watch, for surely God is in this place. God calls us to community. Together we rejoice, for the kindness of Christ shines in the faces of others. God loves us, God changes us, God knits us one to the other, shaping and reshaping the community of Christ. Amen. Please pray with me. 
Holy God, we live and move and have our very being only in you. At your invitation, we have come again to your house to meet you in prayer, in song, in word, and in one another. You have created us as human beings and said it's very good. You've pronounced the goodness of relationships and called us together in community. So teach us now to worship as we are together in spirit and in truth as one body, serving the goals of your kingdom on earth, just as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's go to a place that is pure To learn about love and wipe away tears you melt swords of steel and hearts made of stone he will set prisoners free and give strangers a home So come, come as you are Oh, come from near and far Salvation will taste as we climb the mountain of God. From each corner and end of the earth, we'll gather together to sing of your worth. A blind who can see and weary who rest Good news for the poor, freedom for oppressed So come, come as you are Oh, come from near and far Oh, come, salvation will taste as we climb the mountain of God New life awaits for all who believe all who love mercy do justice walk humbly with Christ as a guide united will be living the kingdom secure in God's peace so come, come as you are Oh, come from near and far Oh, come, salvation will taste As we climb the mountain of God So come, come as you are Salvation will taste as we climb the mountain of God. Together we have been listening to God's word as a community of faith by reading and reflecting often on the Gospel of John chapter 15. This is a passage of scripture that has guided our conversation with one another. And once again, we're going to read it aloud together. <clears throat> and after that, we'll sit in silence for several moments 
listening to what the Holy Spirit might impress upon our minds. So please join me in reading these words of Jesus. I am the true vine, and my heavenly parent is the vine grower. The Lord removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, God prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. been following the order of worship that was sent out earlier, you will notice there's been a few changes at the last minute. And uh, again, thank you for your patience with us. A second scripture reading this morning is also from the Gospel of John, chapter 17. This is a portion of the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples, and it's also a prayer that uh, Jesus has prayed for us. So listen carefully to these words. As I was listening to this earlier, I was wondering how might I or how might we become God's answer to Jesus' prayer? As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, 
so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Physical distancing has become our way of life, hasn't it? When people you don't live with come closer than six feet these days, how often have you found yourself taking a step back? I experienced the other side of that at Vincenzo's just before Christmas when I approached an employee asking for help to find a particular item. The employee's reaction made me realize I had crossed that six-foot barrier. We humans are hardwired for connection. Our mental and physical well-being requires healthy touch. And some would say we need 12 hugs per day for optimal well-being. So what do we do when drawing near is both what we need the most and in this time of pandemic what might make us unwell? Brene Brown has spent nearly 20 years researching shame, vulnerability, and empathy. Out of her vast research, she has surmised that it is connection that gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Indeed, when we are well connected, we do better mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Alternatively, in the absence of strong bonds of connection, we experience suffering and a decline of well-being. Connection is why we're here. God has hardwired us for connection. Relationship and connection, this is who God has created us to be. Indeed, at the very heart of the Trinity is relational connection between God, the Creator, Jesus, the Redeemer, and the Spirit, holy comforter and sustainer. The very essence of our triune God is relational connection. So according to Brene Brown's research, she claims we are experiencing a crisis of disconnection in our society. This crisis has emerged, she says, because we have sorted ourselves into factions based upon our politics and ideology. In other words, we easily divide and distance from one another according to our systems of beliefs, our assumptions, our worldviews, and more. We have a crisis of disconnection because we've turned away from one another and we've turned toward blame and shame. And the outcome? Disconnection, which leaves us lonely, isolated, untethered, scared. Amidst the compulsion to sort ourselves into, into factions of us versus them or we versus they, we cut ourselves off from real connection with others. And at the root, fear. Fear of vulnerability, fear of getting hurt, fear of conflict, fear of criticism or failure, fear of not measuring up, fear of fearing the pain of disconnection. Brown asserts when we move away from a belief in a common humanity and unifying change, we move to blame and shame and resultant disconnection. Throughout this COVID pandemic, social isolation and the loneliness epidemic has drastically increased. Many people are struggling with mental well-being and emotional health. The pandemic has exposed the magnitude of a mental health crisis that was present already prior to March 2020. Many people today are experiencing alienation from society, from their own families, even from themselves. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's witnessed tensions or fractures appearing in friendship and family circles regarding vaccination choices, beliefs in conspiracy theories, or rampant misinformation that floods us every day. 
how easily we can move into us, them thinking. And the end result is this societal connection crisis. And yes, even faith community connection crisis. Contemplative Richard Rohr suggests, and I quote, we are paying the price for centuries in which the church was narrowed from a full vision of peoplehood to an almost total preoccupation with private persons and their devotional needs. But history has shown that individuals who are confirmed in their individualism by the very character of our evangelism will never create church, except after the model of a service station. End of quote. In other words, we use church as a commodity as everything else. Rohr goes on to say one reason for the disconnection is that we've been told we are all on our own. We have believed that the ties that bind us are broken and we don't know how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. This winter, we are leaning into a number of questions and I want to be quick to add that I am not taking the stance of being the authoritative knower with the answers, much less easy answers. Rather, I prefer being a facilitator that's inviting us into deeper thought, reflection, and conversation, which we can bring back into our elder-facilitated conversations. So a statement I believe that's important for us to ground ourselves in as we continue living into this unknown time is appearing on our weekly order of worship. And the statement is this, the future is always unpredictable and hope lies not in what we plan to accomplish, but in the strength of the community we bind ourselves. We've never lived through a pandemic, and we don't know with certainty what the future will hold. Plans we make today could well be redundant in a week. Considering a primary need for each of us is relationship and connection, just take a moment to consider what community or communities are you bound to? What would you say defines the strength of the communities of which you belong? Today, many of us, but not all, belong to virtual communities, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. The list seems to be growing constantly. How many of us measure the strength of our com virtual community based upon how many friends we have or how many likes we receive on a post? Let's consider for a moment, does a virtual community provide us with authentic connection and belonging, those deepest yearnings of our hearts? Let's further consider, is a care group a community? What about a community-based organization such as the Lions or the Optimists? What makes for community? If hope lies in the strength of the community which we bind ourselves, how hopeful do you feel as we live into this unknown future together as a faith community? Week after week, articles arrive in my inbox that highlight how the Christian Church as a community of Jesus followers has and is changing rapidly. Here are some article titles from a variety of sources. Want people back in the pew? Try transcendence over relevance. Church attendance is down 28% year after year. Why traditional religion is dwindling in America? How to approach all the people who haven't come back to church yet? Why the church can't fix itself. Are you picking up on a theme here? One article that I have found helpful is this one. It is called Digital Church in a Lonely World, Seven Ingredients of Church Community. This article is written by the Barna Group. It's a visionary research think tank who most recently have been focused on how the pandemic is reshaping the Christian church. 
According to Barna's September 2020 data, 22% of churched people stopped going to digital or in-person church. 22%. Six months into the pandemic, that's more than one in five who have disengaged. Startingly, this marks a further significant shift in decline from even our pre-pandemic days. So in response to increased disengagement, pastors and congregations as ourselves are wondering, what will the church look like post-pandemic? Together we are seeking, what is God saying to us? What is God up to? The pandemic forced us out of our church building and moved us online. With excellent tech support, we've been able to continue worshiping together, currently in person, joining through Zoom, and later when our worship service is posted online. I've become aware in regular con with a number of congregants that you are sharing our worship service with friends near and far. I've been in regular contact with one particular community member who I became introduced to through a congregant. They live a few hours to our east and have expressed that our worship services have been a lifeline amidst pandemic isolation and loneliness. There have been some significant benefits to moving online. Something I appreciate about this article is that it offers some really good questions for us to ask of our present context. The article asks some right questions and some wrong questions that could lead us toward the wrong destination. So let's first look at the wrong, or what we would call non-fruit-bearing questions. What serves the consumerist Christian market? Will Christians prefer a digital service over attending a physical gathering? If so, how do we cater to that segment of the preference-driven market? As we heard last week, consumer-driven Christianity does not develop resilient and faithful disciples, nor does it nurture spiritual maturity, fruit-bearing. So what might be more helpful questions that hold potential for fruit bearing. Here are two questions we want to spend some time with and pray about, and I've adapted them from this article. So how do we imagine or reimagine community in this digital age? And what is the impact of virtual church on relational, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being and health? In this article, the authors explore some of the ingredients that are necessary to foster church community in an increasingly digital and lonely world, in other words, a disconnected world. And I believe this is a more, more helpful than a discussion about how to get people back in the pews or consider what feeds consumer-driven Christianity. So we have much to learn from the early Christian community. The following are seven ingredients of church community according to the New Testament. So spiritual engagement. Colossians 3.16 we read, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish, that is, caution, advise, or counsel, kindly, gently, in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. Hebrews 13 tells us, remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. As a faith community, we worship and pray together, don't we? In 1 Timothy, we read, in every place pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Evangelism, which can be a word that some of us might actually um, back away from. It's, it's, it's a word that carries a lot of baggage, I believe. But in Acts 1, verse 8, we read, 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What about interpersonal responsibility? Here are just a few pieces from Romans 12. We're encouraged, have love for one another. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, faithful in prayer. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Do not repay evil for evil. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Inconvenient hospitality. In Acts 4, that early Christian community was just forming. They are described as having one heart and soul. No one claimed private ownership of any possession. Everything they owned was held in common. And what is institutional physicality? Matthew 26, 26 include the words of institution for the Lord's Supper. This is a physical act. We share bread and cup together as a faith community. So these seven ingredients, these are consistent elements of local church communities of the New Testament. We could easily name more, such as generosity. We could point to leadership models and more. But as we consider these elements of community, let's ponder. Can we achieve all seven of these by worshiping online? Can each of these seven be achieved through our screens? And I just want to highlight these are not questions of judgment but rather questions for our reflection we've had some experience with virtual community what do you think when connection to the vine and to one another is core to our well-being fruit bearing and a maturing spirituality how connected have you felt over these past 22 months of pandemic Community is interpersonal. It's relational. Community members carry mutual responsibility, willingly contributing to the whole, sharing gifts and talents, our time, our finances, our very self. The body of Christ, a spiritual community, is God's plan. It is both means and message. As we heard, Jesus prayed, May they all be one, so that the world may believe it was you who sent me, that they may be one as we are one, with me in them and you in me. According to Richard Rohr, there is no other form of Christian life except a common one. And until and unless Christ is someone happening between people, the gospel remains largely an abstraction. Until Jesus Christ is passed on personally through faithfulness and forgiveness, through bonds of union, roar doubts whether Jesus is passed on at all. So we do well to remember that the body of Christ is for a purpose far beyond ourselves. The body of Christ is the manifestation of God's kingdom. God's kingdom come here amongst us. Each follower radiating the glow of the epiphany of God. Jamie Gerber reminded me earlier this week of retired Grable professor Tom Yoder Neufeld's wisdom, which he has shared at a number of conferences and places. Tom's interest has long been the early Christian communities which formed in Corinth and Ephesus and beyond. The Bible doesn't whitewash the early church's struggles as they were forming as a community. Factions formed. Heated arguments and dissension ranged, ranged from beliefs to spiritual practices to how to share the Lord's Supper. Tom uses the metaphor of chain gang to describe the struggling early Christian church. And he challenges the church today saying, through Christ, we are chained together in the bonds of peace. 
I recall Tom sharing this wisdom ahead of our 2015 National Assembly vote on being a faithful church recommendations. Actions that could have driven God's people into deep factions of us versus them, we versus they. So how do you feel about being chained together? Being chained together. Returning to these seven ingredients of community, let's consider what elements nurture online and or in-person community. Barna suggests that these four ingredients are met online or in person. Spiritual engagement, preaching, worship and prayer, evangelism. There are many things that we do well virtually. We connect with people beyond our community. We reach people far and wide. As meaningful as these expressions of church are, Barna makes the case that these next three ingredients of community are better achieved in person. Our interpersonal responsibility, loving one another, inconvenient hospitality, sharing the rituals of the church. The very nature of the church is the communion of saints, a shared life together as a community of faith. Oneness in communal life bears witness to the kingdom of God. And I believe one of the best ways, or one of the ways I witnessed committing to the body rather than factions occurred several years ago at an MCEC spring assembly. I recall a harsh question asked from the floor by a delegate. The question was asked of the executive council. Leadership was asked if a very contentious issue was going to be discussed today. And in response, David Martin, then executive minister of MCEC, came to the mic. He was gracious. And he responded, saying, this weekend's conference would not be focused in that way. But then he took a step further, saying, historically, when the Mennonite church have had disagreements, We've believed that there has been only one option open to us. And that one option, one of us needs to leave. And Martin challenged the gathered body, saying he believes the bigger challenge for the people of God is this. How will we live together with all of our diversity? How will we live together with all of our diversity? Sounds a lot like being chained together in the bonds of peace. Diversity does not preclude oneness. We do not need to be same-minded, same-mannered, same-tempered to be one as Jesus prayed. We do not have to all be present within these four walls to be the body of Christ, although when we are not, elements of community will not be fully experienced. I love how the late Rachel Held Evans describes the kingdom of God, and she could easily say, this is what church community is. It's like a bunch of outcasts and oddballs gathered at a table, not because they are rich or worthy or good, but because they are hungry, because they said yes, and there's always room for more. If you and I are not experiencing a sufficient measure of belonging in the body of Christ with a real body of outcasts and oddballs, such as us, how can we ever offer that experience to anyone else? Jesus' teachings on forgiveness and healing and justice are not just a spiritual test for Christian community. Rather, they are the necessary ingredients for a basic shared communal life. Peacemaking and reconciliation are not an eternal reward, but rather the character, the effect, and the strength of Christian community. So while social and physical distancing has become our way of life, may we be a community that is counter-cultural, not throwing safety and love for our neighbors to the wind, but rather by abiding in the vine, 
by nurturing and strengthening the bonds of community. May we strive to live into the oneness for which Jesus prayed, for this is who God has created us for. Amen. Thank you, Kara, for your message. I often feel like I'm one of the oddest of the oddballs, so I must belong here. Thank you. Worship takes many forms among us, and one of those forms is giving of our offerings, which we can do here physically or we can do online. I've even heard that some people do all their banking online these days. <clears throat> But let's be clear about our offerings. We don't give because God needs more money. We give because it's one of the ways that God transforms us and helps us become more generous, just like the God we serve. We have indeed been a very generous community, and you'll see that within our budget reports. Um, you have continued to give generously through the pandemic, through all of the disruptions. And we are thankful for the ongoing generosity that uh, we share and for God's ongoing provision of meaningful work for many of us. So with this in mind, I want to praise the prayer of thanksgiving for the offerings that we give each week for, um, and I just ask God's blessing on the continued work that uh, those offerings make possible. So join me in prayer. God, we continue to live with your generous provision, and so we take time to offer gratitude, saying thank you for your goodness. Even though supply chains may be broken and microchips are not available, nothing can separate us from your love and care experienced in the body of Christ. In the midst of these pandemic disruptions, many changes have come our way, but your mercy never fails. It remains constant. And so we thank you and we commit ourselves to continued generosity. And we ask that you bless the work of our hands and the gifts of time and talent and money that we offer to your service so that your kingdom can bear even more fruit among us. In your name we pray, amen. The week of prayer for Christian unity begins, I believe it's the 18th of January. 
And this is a time when we acknowledge we are members of a large body of Christ, a global body, diverse in language and culture, practice, yet made one through Christ. And so we give thanks for our ecumenical brothers and sisters in Christ, even as we commit to continuing building bridges of understanding and walking in the ways of peace together. Little baby Sloan arrived so quick last Saturday night, we didn't have time to have a flower to announce her arrival. So we congratulate once again Megan, Evan, and Eli on the birth of a baby sister, a little daughter. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Jesus, just as you prayed for your disciples so long ago, pray for us. Pray for our well-being. Pray for our protection. Pray for your joy to be made complete in us. Pray for our spiritual growth and transformation. Pray for your truth to be made complete in us. Jesus, we often do not know how to pray, so pray for us. Pray with us that we may be one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world you so love. Jesus, pray for the weak ones, your strong ones. Pray for your ones who stand in need of healing, hope, and wholeness. Pray for the ones who breeze through life and your ones who struggle in life. Jesus, pray for those who have lost loved ones whose grief is so deep. Pray for those facing tough decisions, those taking on new positions, and those in need of freedom from bondage. Pray for all impacted by COVID, healthcare providers, the sick, the dying, the recovering, the self-isolating, and all who are experiencing isolation, loneliness, and disconnection. And hear us now as we pray as you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'd invite you to stand with me as we receive our sending blessing. As God has sent Christ Jesus into the world, so Christ now sends us into the world. May we go today made holy in God's truth. May we go today connected to the vine. And may we go knit together with the life of the Holy Spirit 
growing the fruit of God's kingdom until we meet again. Amen.